So now, uh, to begin the semester, we start to talk a little bit of a refresher on Java. Uh, for our textbook, at least in this uh, lecture, we'll start to talk about uh, chapters one and two, the introduction to a computer, what it means to program, and then start getting into uh, some elementary programming uh, with that. So uh, the first thing, if we start to take a look at a program, when we start to think about what it means to uh, have a computer, we boil everything down into binary data. If we think about it, we start to look at the ones and zeros. And really, all the ones and zeros are is whether or not I have electricity. So let's do a little exercise here. This is what I would call a switch. Let's even expand this out. So I've got myself a little switch going on here. Right now, that switch has no electricity. Right here, I've got electricity. There's power on this end, but there's none over here because they don't connect. Now, if you've taken any type of engineering course before, as soon as I make kind of these two metal pieces connect, suddenly that electricity is transferring from one side of my hand to the next side of my hand. So why do I talk about this? Well. That's actually where we get the idea of working with data, working with ones and zeros. Because the computer is just a component. All it does is it handles electricity. If you take a look at the motherboard, you take a look at the processor, the memory, all it is is handling electricity. And when I have electricity, I get what we call a one. And so as we start to build these things up, we can start to build out our binary data. So let's think about it. Let's think about it like this. You know, if we have an LED light bulb, uh, by itself with no electricity, it is in the off state. Well, what else can it do? It can turn off uh, so that it's got the zero. We can classify that as a zero, but it can also be on. Now when it's on, that suddenly means that I have power, and that's a different state. So suddenly I get a zero and a one. I have two possible states. So what happens if we add another LED light to the equation? Well suddenly my first state is I have a zero and a zero. But as I look through all the different possible combinations of how electricity can flow through these two LED light bulbs, what I get is suddenly uh, one will have power, the other would have power, or finally, my fourth state, they both have power. So I actually have what we classify as two to the power of two possible states. We have two to the number of variables going on there. This is where we get that idea of taking a single bit, one bit, one, one, or zero, and expanding that out into what we call a byte, eight bits. That's actually, you can think of it as, if, what happens if I had eight LED light bulbs? Well, suddenly, instead of it being two to the second power, I now go two to the eighth power. I got two, I have eight different LED lights that can be on and off, so I have two to the eight power possible combinations of all of those. So why does that matter? Well, when we think about binary again, when we look at the computer, all it does is it handles electricity. If we take a look at that uh, processor on the bottom of the screen, you know, it, I know it's a little vector image, but those little prawns sticking out of it. If we take a look at a real life one, you'll see that it's got a bunch of those prongs sticking out on the back. And if you count them out, they probably have 64 prongs. Well, why? Because it's a 64-bit processor. It's expecting two to the 64 possible combinations of electronic signals. So instead of our LEDs that we had before, we now are dealing with straight electricity. So how does this start to fall into play? Well, memory, memory is memory. It, it is there to store data. But the processor starts to break down into two separate quadrants. It's actually sort of the, the brain of the computer. The first portion is we get what's known as the control logic. And what that does is that acts as sort of the counter, the step-by-step -step instructional set. Think of it this way. Uh, hopefully, you know, you know how to cook. Or if at the best, you know how to boil water uh, and cook ramen. Uh, 
uh, or at least use the microwave. But there's a step-by-step -step instructional set that goes into cooking. Let's just think about, you know, boiling an egg for a second. You fill the pot full of water, you bring the water to a boil, you set the egg inside there, and then you wait. And then you wait. And hopefully, uh, eventually enough time goes by, you take the egg out of the boiling water, you cool it off, you peel it, and you now have a lovely soft or hard boiled egg but it's a sequential step. You have to go order by order. You don't try and take the egg out of the water uh, before the waiting process is done. Otherwise, you undercook your egg or it never gets cooked to begin with. The same thing happens with the control logic. It basically is telling my computer, my CPU, where to go next. That's actually where the ALU picks up. The ALU, that's actually the brains. That's, this, that's the, the brains of the operation. That's what's telling us you know, to do the addition between our binary digits, the, do the multiplication, move our data from uh, one memory location to another memory location. That's where that stuff starts to come into play. It takes that, and as you can see you know, on the slides, I know I'm covering it up a little bit, but we have things like add, or, and, XOR, MV. MV stands for move. Again, that's exactly what it does, is it takes our data and moves it to another spot. Well, that's spot. When we start to look at memory, I said all it did was store data. And if we took a look at memory, that's exactly what it does, is it looks, if we take a look, each one of those little blocks that we see on the memory stick, basically they start at zero, memory address zero, and they continue going on. And another word for that is memory offset. Both work, they're synonymous with each other, but that memory address, well, as our computers load up, as we start to kind of put more and more stuff onto the computer, that needs to get loaded up in somewhere. So the fact that I have uh, screen recording software going on right now, and that's being buffered into uh, my computer. That's actually being stored in memory right now and then slowly but surely being written to my hard drive. Well, something as simplistic as uh, the word hello. Hello is just that. Uh, you know, we take each one of those letters, each one of those letters has a binary notation. So hopefully you've brushed up on your ASCII. Uh, but each one of those letters has a binary notation 0 to 256 or 0 to 255 that then has to get stored into memory somewhere. Well, this putting these things in the memory. How does how do we start to do that? Because obviously I don't want to have to do MV. Uh, let's think about, for example, uh, the idea of just simple addition or simple multiplication. Simple multiplication is just repeated addition. So if I were to load up Notepad++, and I were to say something like 2 times 64, what I'm really looking at here is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. I'm looking at the binary notation of 2. If you were to remember from binary conversion in CIS 110, this is you can convert this out and you'll get 2. Now, instead of just doing 64, I can't just do this. This is how to represent 64 in binary, but the CPU doesn't know how to do that. We have to teach it. We have to build it. And what happens is I would have to do repeated addition. I would have to continuously add to this. And eventually, I'd get something like this. I would get now four. And then I'd add another two, and I'd add another two, and I'd add another two. And that would be literally my program, multiplication. Again, that's what we classify as more of a low-level language. Uh, but we want to go ahead and expand on that. We want to design languages that are a little bit more complex. We start to look into different styles of programming languages. Well, doesn't matter which one you learn. One of the idioms 
one of the little things that uh, advanced programmers or advanced developers sort of laugh at is beginners always saying, uh, how many languages do you know? And truth is, it doesn't matter how many languages you know. For example, I don't know Mandarin. You know, I don't know Spanish. I don't know French. I know that sucks. I'm sorry. I'm trying to work on my Duolingo. But I'm able to get by in the environment I live in by using simply one language and using that language very well. That might not always be the case. The same thing goes on with programming languages. Really, if you know one language, you know them all. The logic is still there, making variables, making conditional statements, loops. The rest is extra fluff. Well, we take that information and we start to build upon it. And what we do is we develop what's known as source code. What we do with that source code is we actually convert that into machine code via the compiler. Now the compiler, all it is, is it acts as a translator for us. It basically comes in and it says, all right, this is what the source code means to the computer. So again, I don't have to do that 2 times 64 multiplication into addition. I don't have to make the repeated addition happen. I just have to say 2 asterisk 64. So now that we've started to build upon this idea, we break down into something called computational thinking. What does it mean to actually have knowledge? And that breaks down. It, uh, we have different kinds of knowledge. We have uh, declarative and imperative. And this kind of breaks down in the idea of you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. You teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. That idiom is right in place here because declarative knowledge is exactly that. It's just statements of fact. It's a very cut and dry example. Pi is 3.141592, you know, what it, what it says on there. Uh, our classroom that we go into is NB243. My name is Adam Goita. My hair is brown. I'm wearing blue with white stripes. That's factual declarative information teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. That is imperative knowledge. That's that how to, it's the algorithms of programming. It's how we design out the code. Uh, for example, how do I fish? I don't actually know how to fish. And what happens if I didn't have someone who could teach me? What if I couldn't call up my dad or my, my uncle and say, teach me how to fish? Well, and say the internet doesn't exist, so I can't go on the YouTubes and figure it out. You know. How do I figure it out? Well, that's actually where we as computer programmers start to pick up, is we start to go and we start to pick that out. And we start to figure out how to make our recipes. Again, those recipes, you know, if we think about it in that food analogy again, instead of boiling an egg, think of something more complex like chicken cordon bleu. There's a lot of set-by-set -set instructions that go into chicken cordon bleu. First, we have to get the ingredients. And I don't mix those ingredients all together at once, uh, because if I do, I get this weird slop, and that's just not what I want. What I have to do is I suddenly I mix my dry ingredients, and I set them to the side, and I mix my wet ingredients, and I set them to the side. Then, you know, then I don't just immediately try and bread the chicken. I have to split the chicken in half. I have to flatten it out so that when I lay my cheese and my ham inside it, I can roll it up, bread it, and then cook it as need be. So there is that step-by-step -step process. I have to follow it, otherwise I ruin my chicken. I get salmonella and no more class. Not that bad. So how do we build our own languages? Well, we start by looking at something what we call uh, primitive constructs, primitive operators. Uh, every language has these, be it a programming language or English. And all they do is, as we continue to, st we start with the basics, but as we continue to build upon them, we make more and more complex uh, statements. Think about the word bathroom. Bathroom. Bathroom by itself, all right. If a five-year-old were to come up to you and say bathroom, you know, you probably understand get an inference of, oh, okay, well, you mean use the bathroom, or where is the bathroom, and you point them on their way. But at what point do you kind of look at someone and go, use your words, 
you know, say a 10-year-old walked up to you and said bathroom. Are you suddenly like, what are you asking? Bathroom by itself is just a noun. It's a primitive operation. It's a primitive word. But we can start to build upon it if we start to add in more context. If we start to go, where is the bathroom? All these primitive words stringed together, we now get a comprehensive, complex sentence. Well, we can even make that even more. That's just a question. But if I were to say, where is the bathroom, said little Billy doing the PP dance, I've taken my question and I've now turned it into an actual story. I made it more complex as I continue to build on that idea. The same thing happens inside of programming languages. The first thing we talk about are those primitive constructs. In English, it's words, it's punctuation. In Java, we have a little bit of something different. We have numbers, strings, operators. Now, I'll take a second to just think about uh, strings for a bit, because strings are not the same as text, and that's always something that throws people off in the beginning. But when we think about strings, this is text, hello world. If I wanna represent that sentence. If I want to actually have my computer program say hello world, I have to include quotations, double quotes on both sides of it. Hello world. That allows me now to store that as a primitive construct, as a piece of information. So we can continue to build on this idea. Again, bathroom by itself, not proper English syntax. You know, the word's right, but it's not how we would use that. That's where we start to get into static semantics, how things are being built up. Uh, syntactically, is it a valid meaning? For example, uh, I am Spartacus. My name is Adam Gawida. Where is the bathroom? Can I use the bathroom? Uh, Donde esta el baño? Those are all valid uh, syntax for Okay, all but the Banyo one uh, are valid for English. That one's for Spanish. The same thing actually happens with programming. Something like 1.8 divided by 1.8. That's syntactically valid. That's semantically valid. 1.8 divided by cat. Not so much, you know, I, I don't even understand kind of the concept and how it would go on there. That seems like animal cruelty, if my opinion were dividing cats all of a sudden. I don't like that. I like cats. That's where that stuff comes into play. And then finally, we get just simple semantics. You know, what does it mean? For example, in English, the reason why I mention this is English can be interpretive. So suddenly, something like Java is so awesome. That sentence by itself can have a number of different meanings. I can be sarcastic with that. I can be truthful. I can say, Java is so awesome! Ah! Freaking out and wigging out over here. And I have, okay, you can tell I have a passion about Java. Or you could look at maybe some of the students and they're like, Java is so awesome. Well, but aside from the, the cross-eyedness, you know, what did I do? I gave you the verbal cues that I was actually not 100% saying, I was saying the same thing, but I was not saying it the same way. Programming's a little different. Suddenly, there's only one meaning for anything. If I say, for example, Java equals awesome as a string, what I'm saying is I now have stored in memory something called Java. A variable and I have it being stored as the ones and zeros that represent the character notation of the word the string awesome so a w e all lowercase still all that matters but there is no there's no hidden context it all means one thing so we'll stop there